Okay. As we wait for more people to come on the line, some housekeeping rules first. This webinar has interpretation to Spanish and Portuguese. If you wish to listen in those languages, please click on the interpretation icon and select Spanish, Portuguese or English. Buenos días a todos. Este webinario está eh, traducido a español y a portugués. Por favor, en la parte de abajo pueden eh, escoger el icono interpretación y escoger el idioma. And as always, let us know in the chat if you're having any technical issues and this webinar is being recorded. Asimismo, si tienen alguna inconveniente o tienen preguntas, por favor, déjenos saber en el chat en la parte que eh, está ubicado. Eh, bueno, puede ser que esté a la derecha en, la, en el icono de más. Chat. Gracias. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon and good morning, everybody, depending where you are. And welcome to this discussion on Just Transition. With our guest speakers today, we'll be looking at green jobs and workforce needs as we journey through a zero emission economy. My name is Virginia Bagnoli. I'm Senior Project Manager in the Government and Policy Team at Climate Group. And today we're here to learn from our special guest about green and climate jobs. And actually we recently discussed this topic with our CEO, Helen Clarkson, on a new episode of our 50 Shades of Green podcast. Specifically, they talked about um, how the concept of green jobs has evolved across various industries and how governments and the private sector have adopted the changing labor circumstances in the energy transition. You can check it out wherever you listen to your podcasts. A greener, lower emissions economy requires new green skills, both for emerging jobs and for existing jobs that are evolving. Think about those who work in the oil and gas industry or working for an automotive sector, making cars running on petrol. This transition will be impossible without a suitably trained workforce and human talent to match demand. So in this session now, our speakers will share insights on how to create policies that ensure workers benefit from the shift to a decarbonized economy and highlight success stories, for example, from Colombia and the US. Get ready to maybe learn something new and we hope you'll feel inspired by what we discover together today. Super quickly, let's have a look at the agenda. We have about 90 minutes together. I'll soon give the floor to my colleague Faryal Gohar, project manager for the Just Transition Task Force, who will let you know more about the project, which we're running in partnership with the Scottish government. We'll then be chatting with our brilliant speakers, Sharon Leslie Barrow, Nestor Roberto Garzon Cadena, and Chun Yi Yip. We'll, who I will introduce properly later, don't worry, and who will bring diverse perspective to green jobs creation, workforce upskilling, and reskilling. Towards the end of the webinar, we'll take some questions from the floor and wrap up. Thanks again for joining. We're really happy you're here with us today. And just as a quick icebreaker, as more people have come on the line in the last few minutes, please type in the chat uh, an answer to one or more of the following questions. As always, your name and government, we always want to learn, you know, from where you're connecting from and tell us an example of a popular green job in your region. All in the chat, please. This is being translated in all the channel, in all the channels. Let me just have a peek at the chat. Oh, hi, Lucas. Great to have you here from Rondonia, Brazil. Oh, Liz from Western Cape, welcome. From South Africa here, we see strong focus on renewable energy jobs. Of course, manufacturing as well as installation and operation. As we get more responses in the chat, I'll now give the floor to my colleague Faryal to introduce the Just Transition Task Force project, which is hosting the session. Faryal, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are dialing from. Um, and our honorable guest speakers, my name is Faryal Gohar, and I'm a project manager for the Ender2 Coalition at Climate Group. On behalf of the Ender2 Coalition, I welcome you all to our today's session, uh, which is going to be around on reskilling and upskilling of the labor force. Um, and I would really like to begin by giving you an overview of the Just Transition Task Force in case there are any new participants who are joining the session for the first time. Um, so the Just Transition Task Force is a partnership between the Scottish government and the Climate Group as Secretariat of the Under2 Coalition. Through this project, we have established a, a task force which is comprised of global states and regional governments um, who um, um, and um, to whom we are guiding on just transition issues. Um, just give me a second, let me... Um, in terms of the geographical footprint of the task force, as you can see here on the screen, we have got a very good mix of uh, states and regional governments who are coming from global north as well as global south. So in total, the task force is comprised of 19 states and regional governments. In the first phase of the project, uh, we had 11 active uh, members who stayed really committed throughout the project. And just recently, in the second phase of the project, eight more states and regional governments have joined the task force. Um, so at the moment we are in the second phase of the um, of the of the project, um, and we are doing that in in partnership with the Scottish government. And we did the first phase of the project from 2022 to 2023, and then from last year up until now, we are in the second phase of the project. Um, during the first phase of the project, and with a huge support from the Scottish government, we did manage to achieve a lot. Uh, for example, first of all, we recruited the governments from the Under2 Coalition to join the task force, and we interviewed about 20 governments to understand their positioning and the perspective on just transition issues. And as a result of that, uh, we published an internal analysis. Uh, later, we convened the task force multiple times. We delivered multiple uh, peer forums and also workshops um, on on several issues that were being requested by the task force members. And finally, we published some case studies uh, highlighting some uh, success stories, which we widely disseminated among the Under2 Coalition uh, membership. Um, I would really like to request my colleague, Huli, if you can please share some resources and links in the chat in case um, some of the participants would like to review these resources in their time, they could do that. Um, then recently in the second phase of the project, again, uh, we did um, uh, like a massive outreach. We reached out to the under two coalition members um, so that they could join the task force. And as a result of that, uh, we were being joined by eight more governments. And then just like how we did the internal analysis in the first phase of the project, we were also very keen to understand the positioning of the new task force members. So we conducted a survey. And as a result of that, uh, based on the input that we received from the uh, members, we then designed multiple activities for the second phase of the project, including providing policy support through peer learning. Um, as a result of that, just recently, we have um, compiled a library of 10 key readings for the subnational governments on just transition issues, which we have just disseminated uh, last week. Uh, please let us know your feedback on how you have found it. Um, again, I would like to request my colleague to share the resources in the chat um, so that everyone can access it. Um, and then also we are delivering a series of fair forums. So for example, last year we convened and we talked about um, finance and governance for just transition. And today, again, we have reconvened um, in the form of this fair forum, and we are going to focus on reskilling and upskilling of workforce. And finally, we are also uh, promoting the profile of the regional and the state governments who are actively involved in just transition. Um, and just recently, we are working with Yucatan uh, from Mexico, Pernambuco from Brazil, and Western from um, South Africa, and we are working with them to develop a few case studies, which we will be publishing in the next three weeks. So please keep an eye on that. Uh, we will also be disseminating those via email. So you will receive those once they are available. Um, and with today's fair forum, the second phase of the Just Transition Task Force has come to an end. Um, in terms of next steps going forward at Climate Group, we are really mindful of uh, the Just Transition and equity issues. Um, 
and uh, we are working um, and we are building, uh, we are working to build onto that work. And so we are very keen to integrate uh, these issues within our three years of strategy at Climate Group. Um, if you have any suggestions or if you have got any propositions or ideas that you would like to share with us, please feel free to get in touch and we'll be very happy uh, to pick up on uh, different options. Um, I think I'll just stop here and hand it over to you, Virginia, because we have got some interesting uh, speakers. Um, so let's hear from them. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Faryal, for a great update on the project. Um, let's meet our speakers now. They all bring a wealth of experience and diverse perspective to our discussion. So we're very, very pleased to have them. Um, let's do a quick round of introduction. Um, our first speaker, Sharon Leslie Barrow, she's a true champion of workers' rights. She's former General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation and former president of the Australian Council of Trade Unions. And Sharon has dedicated her career to advocating for fair and just working conditions. Um, Sharon, let's just test your microphone again and if you want to say a few words. Uh, good uh, afternoon, good morning. It's very early here, but I'm delighted to be with you. Awesome. Thanks, Sharon. We'll come to you in a second. Um, next, our next speaker is Nestor Roberto Garzon Cadena, Director of Climate Change and Risk Management at the Colombian Ministry of the Environment. He has background in engineering and extensive experience in disaster prevention and environmental planning and he will be speaking in Spanish today. So please make sure you, you select the right channel to listen to him. Um, Nestor, let's just check again that the mic works. Then we can hear you fine. Hola. Gracias, buenos días, ¿me escuchan? Yes, all good, fantastic. We'll come to you also in a minute. Perfecto, um, buenos días. And finally, we're pleased to welcome Chun Hee Ip, Vice President of Social Impact at Landlease, a global leader in infrastructure investment. She brings two decades of experience in social impact and sustainability programming, coupled with her leadership in promoting workforce development and diversity within the private sector. Hi, Chun Yi. Just checking your mic as well. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Looking forward to this conversation. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so as I said, together our speakers represent a diverse area of backgrounds and expertise offering insights from workers' rights advocacy, government policies and private sector uh, as well. So really a warm welcome um, to you all. Now it's with pleasure that I give the floor to Sharon Barrow for her talk and doing a bit of scene setting for our session really. Thanks again for being here with us, Sharon, as um, well, on behalf of the whole climate group, really. Um, for those who don't know, as Sharon said just now, she's, she was so kind to join this webinar live from Australia. So at insane hours, basically. So thank you and over, over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to be with you. Can I congratulate you on this initiative? Following the Paris Climate Agreement, where after more than 15 years of campaigning, trade unions were successful with civil society, with the support of progressive areas of business, and indeed uh, um, many other and many governments, we were able to get the commitment to just transition in the preamble to the Paris Climate Agreement. With civil society, we also got human rights in, in the uh, preamble. So I think it's good to remember that those two things govern, amongst others, the uh, outcomes that we all seek from uh, climate action, ambitious climate action that's vital to stabilise the planet. But following this agreement, then the unions moved on to advocate indeed for um, uh, inquiries, committees, commissions, tripartite, quadripartite, including a community where that was relevant, to actually talk about and plan for, lay down the principles for a just transition. In fact, the ILO, which is the uh, you know Parliament uh, of Workers, Community, uh, sorry, Workers, Governments and, uh, and Employers, um, setting international labour rights actually also negotiated a set of just transition guidelines. But really, 
in terms of many of those committees, it became obvious that where you could sustain that, where you could embed legislative uh, institutions, then this would work for what is a long-term challenge, a a medium medium term and long-term to ensure a just transition. So, of course, the Scottish Just Transition uh, Commission is a model that should be emulated around the world. And uh, permanent authorities, while they're few, but uh, they are growing and they do provide models for others to follow. And I would just point out, amongst others, to Scotland, Spain, South Africa, Australia and Canada, Canada is uh, looking at a bill right now that would put in place uh, a partnerships council. And, uh, And indeed, it demonstrates that all of these authorities have taken a slightly different approach but essentially embed both dialogue and collective responsibility for industrial transition with people and the planet at the heart of economic development. Now, of course, energy is the foundation for all industries, and we do need to move away from fossil fuels. As the UN Secretary General says, we need to end our addiction with fossil fuels. But let me come back to that. I want to say that as we transition to renewable energy, to clean energy sources and to the um, the various areas of intense energy that can be built off renewables, such as green hydrogen, then there are jobs in the transition. Indeed, uh, some six years ago uh, with the WRI, we did an intensive job study and it still remains pretty much the case that for every 20 jobs in renewable energy, there's five to 10 in manufacturing. There's more in, uh, indeed, uh, other upstream and downstream uh, um, processes that are vital for our economy. And uh, if they're good jobs, then they count to 30 to 35 jobs in the broader um, community. That means, indeed, place-based development. And that is so important. This is the, the, the opportunity, the first opportunity, I would argue, where if we get the planning right, if people are involved, if community renewal, which includes jobs, decent work, and of course the skills to make it possible for workers, if that's on the table, if there are agreements that are transparent and indeed monitored jointly, then we can see that place-based development will not just protect communities, but it will offer a new development model for sustainable growth for indeed people and indeed the environment. So when you look at the three themes that you've laid out for today, they're central and they're not just central to the concept of just transition, they're central to the elements that actually make up for just transition. They build trust, transparency and sustainability with workers and their communities and that's got to be absolutely vital to success. Because without social license, the cost of fear, distrust and opposition, indeed a risk at, at uh, best, delay, um, you know, somewhere in the middle and at worst failure. So when you actually think about what does inclusive social dialogue mean for just transition, then it means that you have to invite people to the table. Workers, and where, of course, it's about community, those representatives with their unions, with their community organisation should be at the table, co-planning, co-creation, whatever you want to call it, but a transparent agreement that, based on those processes, can be agreed by workers and communities and, indeed, monitored throughout the uh, the process to see that the outcomes agreed are there. I'll come back to financing, but we also need to price in the cost of those processes, or indeed, again, we will fail. You can't go ahead with climate uh, ambition, uh, with projects that are designed to uh, move, uh, move the dial, and at the same time, just say, oh, well, governments or for- philanthropy will ensure just transition processes. That will not work. It has to be tripartite and quadripartite responsibility with companies who are indeed involved and investors basically making the difference 
in terms of a just transition or inclusive approach. I, I would say that systemic has a huge figure and so avoided risk is also very important to investors and companies if they're serious about this. And systemic's figure shows that at the moment that uh, investors and companies risk up to $100 billion of climate finance every year where they don't actually practice um, inclusive uh, dialogue and, uh, and processes. <coughs> That's a big number. Sorry, I'm suffering a little. That's a big number and indeed it's set to grow if we don't get it right. Then, of course, your second uh, theme about equity and policies in terms of green workforce development and you talk about examining policies and partnerships ensuring that green jobs are accompanied by equity rights and social protection well again this is at the heart of just transition if you consider that the jobs that we uh, protect and create must be good jobs decent work indeed if that's the case then you get that multiplier impact of economic development in the community and more broadly a field through supply and demand uh, um, multipliers. But we also need two other factors. We need resilience, and that means where people are in fact uh, um, at risk or displaced for periods of time, that they actually have social protection, that no uh, worker or their family is left without vital income without uh, indeed reskilling support and redeployment support. But we also need to make sure that uh, it's inclusive because I can tell you in clean energy um, alone, women are very underrepresented. They actually in the, the trades, traditional trades that are so vital now to, uh, to making sure we can move quickly then they make up uh, less than uh, 8% of the apprentices and pretty much even where you've got uh, university qualifications and women are better represented in outcomes from qualifications at university, they're employed in uh, not much greater number. So this is still not an inclusive, a gender inclusive uh, environment and it must change. The, uh, the other thing I would say is that in this context, um, where you look at your third uh, um, theme, which is effective workforce transition, uh, with highlighting strategies for success, for pre preparing the fossil fuel workforce for the green economy transition, and with a focus, of course, uh, although not exclusively, on upskilling and reskilling, then this is in fact the challenge. We, can, we must look after workers and their communities in coal communities because we simply must move on immediately from coal. And that means in the next five to 10 years. But oil and gas, we need to see them move as well. They've got an incredible uh, base of capital, of workforce, skilled workforce, of uh, um, technology and infrastructure but many of them simply refuse to move. The IEA has set a capex of 50% of expenditure in sustainable uh, areas of, uh, of energy by 2030. We need to push oil and gas companies who are willing to transition and make them go faster, get them to put people before profit. And we must in fact uh, make sure that those that are at risk of stranded assets are highlighted, they are called out and that governments are called on to act to make sure that they are going to transition or to look at uh, the alternatives to make it possible. But I wanted to say here that all industries must transition because if you look at upstream and downstream uh, processing, manufacturing, transport and logistics, the end users of these products in, in construction, um, and therefore cleaning up heavy industries like steel, aluminium, cement, then we know it's possible. In fact, if you look to Sweden, who was the first uh, to take on the clean steel challenge, then there were more jobs in the hydrogen end of the process than were lost initially. And so that required reskilling, but it actually now, co-locating those plants, it's giving you an example in places like Bodum of the post-potential 
for place-based development. If you look at the COP outcomes, then they laid out critical pathways that go to these questions. And they're pathways that must respect speed and scale if we're to stabilise the planet. So when you look at, uh, indeed, the global targets and the critical work in these pathways, then, again, it re-emphasises the energy transition as a foundation for broader economic transition because we're actually in an industrial revolution to some extent. If every industry has to trans, uh, transition, then we need to make sure that that's a just transition. But when you look at their, um, uh, their commitment to triple renewable energy by 2030, to actually uh, look towards, uh, and they, op they actively see that as uh, an opportunity for green industrialization. If you look at uh, furthering the pledge to end deforestation and moving away from fossil fuels, then these things set out a pathway. And when you look at the fact that even though in 2015 we achieved just transition in the Paris Climate Agreement, it took us till 2023 to actually get a, the UNFCCC, the countries of the world, their leaders agree to a just transition work plan, then you see how you just have to stay the distance. So it can't be all just at the, um, at the government level. We must also make sure that this is, uh, you know, from the ground up so that you have uh, communities, workers in the workplaces, integrated planning, the capacity for looking at opportunities for place-based development, for reducing indeed emissions from unnecessary transport and, um, and logistics, but also making sure that all associated industries are transitioning. This is probably the biggest systemic shift of our lifetime. It's got opportunities for workers, it's got opportunities for communities, but, it will, it, but we will fail if workers and communities are not at the table in terms of co-creation, co-planning, transparency of agreements, and indeed monitoring of outcomes. And if we don't price in with finance the cost of those processes and outcomes, then again, we will fail and leave people without hope and, of course, leave projects at the risk of being stranded assets. So no stranded assets indeed, but no stranded workers and no stranded communities. That's the essence of a just transition. Thank you, Sharon, um, for all your thoughts, really, and for giving this talk um, today. I was taking frantically just some notes because what you said is really, well, so many things stuck with me, actually. Um, you know, the two factors that you, you talked about, um, resilience, making sure that workers are protected um, in, through the whole journey, really, but also um, the, the figures you share with us about in, in inclusivity um, and women in, in renewables also is quite, it's really interesting. Um, so th thanks again. You're more than welcome to stay and listen in to the rest of the webinar, but we completely understand if you want to call it a day, given the, yeah, the hours for you. Um, so yeah. Thank you. And I'll stay for a while, but uh, please forgive me because I do start again at 7 a.m. So Oh, I wow. will uh, listen to what I can and then I'll leave you. But thank you for the honour of the invitation and good luck. Oh, thank you. That's very, very kind. Um, okay, let's move on to the, to the other speakers. We're ready to move to the next section. I'll invite now, um, you know, Nestor and Chung Yi to turn your cameras on. Um, just a heads up, again, we don't have slides today. So let's focus on our speakers um, and just have, let's just look at them <laughs> as they speak. Um, in our conversation with Nestor and Cheng Yi today, we want to explore together, again, sustainable workforce program, how those are working on the ground. And it's great, I think, that you both bring um, different perspectives but two important sides of the story, if you will. So the government and the private sector experience. Um, can we start from you, uh, Chung, Chung Yi? I, know, I hope it's okay that I just call you by, by the name. Um, can, you, can you briefly introduce your organization's approach to workforce 
upskilling and reskilling, transition into a net zero emissions economy that can maybe inspire others to act. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for having me. Uh, can you hear me? My name is Chun Yi, and yes. I'm from uh, with Lend Lease. And for those of you not familiar with Lend Lease, we are a global integrated real estate built environment organization. So we invest, we develop, and we construct properties. We're actually based in Australia, Sydney, and we've got presence um, in Asia, Europe, and in the US, I'm based in New York. And my role is around um, social impact. And what that means is that the organization in, um, four years ago basically launched two targets, um, an environmental one to be net zero by 2040, and then also a social value target to create social value, $250 million, uh, Australian dollars worth of social value by 2025. So we are in year four of that journey. Mm -hmm. And together with these targets, um, I think it's really given us a North Star to think about what our purpose is, right? What we're trying to achieve from um, a, a sustainability perspective, both environmental and social. So in the work that we do to achieve these things in many, many different ways, our projects are delivering social value by working directly with their communities and their clients and investors and what's important to them. And then we also work, um, I would say, above and beyond compliance and, and um, requirements in the community where we're thinking about sort of the overall industry, right? And the ecosystem. And the role that I play in is really connecting a lot with community-based organizations and nonprofits to achieve uh, our targets. And in this case, uh, focus on green economy and the workforce. We basically leverage the expertise of folks that understand this space and we work together to think about the demand and the supply. So back to Sharon's point earlier about stakeholders and transparency, that's really critical in this process. And we have found that, you know, understanding what people really need um, helps us then make the right investments and, and funding. So I'll pause there. That's a lot of information. Hopefully that's um, a good introduction to this. Yes, no, yes, it is. And we'll, of course, I'll ask you some more questions to go a little bit deeper um, into what you were saying. Um, I'd like to ask the same question now to Nestor uh, Garzon, um, just to say that he will speak in Spanish. So please, please select the, the language um, for you to listen to him. Um, Nestor, again, it's the same, same question, really. We'd love to hear from you to give a... Um, a bit some, some background about your your government approach to workforce upskilling and reskilling in the transition to a low or net zero emissions economy that can inspire others to to act over to you gracias eh, bueno buenos días otra vez para todos para nosotros también es un gusto poder estar acá y compartir con ustedes algunas de las experiencias que estamos desarrollando pues de en Colombia eh, antes de, de iniciar, pues es importante mencionar que Colombia es un país multidiverso y multicultural. Esto hace que eh, tengamos diferentes tipos, por decirlo de alguna forma, de población. Tenemos población afro, tenemos población campesina, tenemos población indígena, eh, tenemos eh, gitanos, o sea, tenemos una diversidad cultural. Y en ese orden de ideas también tenemos diversas actividades que desarrollan estas diferentes eh, comunidades en, en todo el territorio. La llegada para el Ministerio de Ambiente en particular no es una llegada fácil. Tenemos un gobierno también que de alguna forma es, es centralista. Desde el gobierno nacional se dictan algunas políticas, se dictan algunas directrices que eh, pues en, el, en el, los gobiernos locales esperamos que puedan ser atendidas. Eh, frente al tema de la transición justa de la fuerza laboral eh, tenemos algunas complicaciones por ejemplo en, en poder transmitir estos mensajes dado que los lenguajes que manejan las comunidades, los lenguajes que manejan las diferentes organizaciones que tenemos en, esto, en los territorios pues no, digamos que no, no son los mismos entonces eso nos ha costado 
eh, bastante trabajo. Tratar de unir eh, la parte técnica y la parte comunitaria no es fácil. Eh, tratar de, de, de lograr, como decía eh, la, la, la colega que estuvo conversando antes, ese equilibrio entre la llegada de lo nacional, las acciones que se desarrollan desde, desde el gobierno central y las acciones que desarrollan de abajo hacia arriba eh, no es un punto que sea eh, muy, muy, muy fácil de lograr. Ese ha sido, digamos, uno de los mayores problemas que nosotros hemos, hemos tenido y hemos encontrado. Eh, decía yo que tenemos diferentes instrumentos de política, diferentes instrumentos con los cuales esperamos poder eh, llegar a los territorios eh, y obviamente venimos trabajando desde básicamente los compromisos internacionales. Alguien mencionaba también, por ejemplo, eh, los resultados eh, de la COP de cambio climático. Esos resultados de la COP nosotros los hemos incluido en diferentes instrumentos, hemos generado algunos compromisos y aunque ustedes eh, tal vez lo conozcan, Colombia no es un país que genera, de, digamos, bastantes o un número importante de emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero, a pesar de que Colombia no es un país que genera ese, ese tipo de emisiones tan altas, sí es un país que eh, tiene diversas vulnerabilidades ante el cambio climático. Como mencionaba también, dada su geografía, dadas sus condiciones, tenemos diferentes pisos térmicos y algunos de ellos han sido bastante o altamente afectados. Entonces, eh, trabajar con las comunidades en el cambio de hábitos, en el cambio de costumbres ancestrales, en el cambio de, 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 de su manera de vivir y pasar a unos ejercicios diferentes, dado que su territorio está cambiando y que las actividades que desarrollaban históricamente muy posiblemente ya no puedan desarrollarse, no es un tema fácil para ellos. Y poder llegar con ese mensaje, con ese, con ese lenguaje, pues tampoco ha sido fácil para el Ministerio de Ambiente. Entonces, venimos trabajando conjuntamente con otros eh, compañeros, aquí se llaman sectores de gobierno, entonces con el sector de educación, con el sector de trabajo, con el sector de cultura, desarrollando diferentes estrategias conjuntas que permitan poder dar ese mensaje que tenemos que impartir en este caso a todos los gobiernos subnacionales. Quisiera seguir hablando, pero, pero creo que voy a parar acá para poder dar paso a los otros compañeros que obviamente desean también compartir sus experiencias. Thank you, Nestor. Um... I think that's really interesting to, to hear. And actually, I, I would like to stay with you to ask you a couple of more questions. Um, and then we can go back to Chen Yi. Um, first of all, really interesting to hear about, you know, how also you're, you're telling us the story of a territory that is also changing in Colombia because you're vulnerable and vulnerable to many, um, you know, impacts due, due to climate change. And that's absolutely um, great, well, interesting to hear. Um, can you elaborate and tell us more about Colombia's approach to identifying and addressing workforce gaps in particular? So in the context, of course, of transitioning to a more sustainable economy. What, what lessons have been learned from this process? So really working around workforce gaps um, from, from your experience. I know there's a moment for translating. <laughs> okay, eh, me preguntas a mí, ¿cierto? Yes. Okay, bien. Eh, como les decía, mmm, identificar las problemáticas, eh, entender... Eh, a las comunidades, estamos hablando, insisto, de pueblos indígenas que tienen eh, ancestralmente sus lenguas, sus costumbres, no es una tarea fácil. Eh, voy a poner un ejemplo muy puntual. 
mmm, las comunidades indígenas en Colombia yeah. tienen eh, culturalmente sus momentos de siembra y cosecha de sus alimentos. Eh, históricamente ellos los hacen eh, entendiendo las dinámicas lunares, las dinámicas del sol, son su, es su cultura. Y ellos hacen diferentes procesos, por ejemplo, de quemas, quemas de territorios para prepararlos ante cuando ya empiezan las lluvias y empezar a sembrar. Como el cambio climático ha generado diferentes eh, eh, cambios en el tiempo también de, esos, de esas siembras, eh, nos están generando en algunos casos problemas asociados a incendios forestales. Eh, nosotros no podemos llegar de una manera impositiva ante, las comunidades, ante esas comunidades para decirles, ustedes no pueden hacer eso, ustedes ya no pueden hacer ese, esa manera de siembra sin tener las herramientas adecuadas. Para esto, el gobierno nacional, hablando un poco de lo que sería de arriba hacia abajo, ha diseñado diferentes instrumentos. Uno de ellos, muy importante para Colombia, es el Plan Nacional de Desarrollo. El Plan Nacional de Desarrollo es un instrumento que se construye con ellos, identificando cuáles son sus necesidades y cuáles son las alternativas económicas, técnicas y administrativas del gobierno para atender algunas de las problemáticas que se encuentran. Este Plan de Desarrollo, de desarrollo se hace cada cuatro años y en este documento quedan plasmadas todas las iniciativas que desde el gobierno se llevan a territorio y se construyen, insisto, conjuntamente. Hay otro documento, otro instrumento, otra herramienta que se desarrolló conjuntamente con otros sectores, en este caso liderada por el Ministerio de Trabajo de Colombia, que es la política de reindustrialización. Esta política de reindustrialización también es una estrategia, una estrategia de la estrategia justa eh, de la fuerza laboral. Importante, algunos de los elementos que contiene esta, esta política, la política para nosotros es un documento guía, es, es, es un derrotero, es, es el objetivo hacia donde eh, de, diseñamos diferentes, a través de la política diseñamos diferentes caminos para llegar a, a un objetivo común. En esta política se encuentra eh, un tema, cuatro temas importantes que son eh, lo agroproductivo y sostenible, eh, biomasa y química verde, algo que es Colombia Biointeligente y salud y bienestar. Entonces, estos son dos instrumentos supremamente importantes que relacionan o incluyen lo que es la transición justa y hay otro elemento súper importante en Colombia eh, sobre el cual estamos trabajando todos los sectores de gobierno que es la contribución nacionalmente determinada, la NDC. La NDC es la ruta que tenemos como gobierno para poder atender las problemáticas que tenemos y que se están enfrentando por temas de cambio climático, dentro de los cuales está asociado obviamente todo lo de la transición justa de la fuerza laboral. Fantastic. Thank you, Néstor. Um... That's great to hear about your national development plan. And if you if you can share more information in the chat for everyone to, to check that out, that would of course be um be amazing. Um be before we move on to the next speaker, I do have one extra question. I know that you've you've touched on this a little bit now in your in your answer, but is there anything more that you want to share with us on how in Colombia? you're working um, together also or collaborating with subnational governments, you know, counties, cities and regions as well and other stakeholders to, to identify workforce gaps effectively and how to ensure the local communities are, you know, prepared for the shift. Um, you, you talked about the tools. Is there anything else that you want to, to, to say on this? Sí, mira, um, bueno, con gobiernos nacionales, eh, incluso con diferentes agencias de cooperación, 
Este ministerio, al igual que las otras carteras lideradas o coordinadas en este caso por una oficina eh, de la presidencia de la República directamente, que es Cancillería, eh, a través de esta oficina nosotros hacemos todo el proceso de canalización y trabajos de coordinación y cooperación, en este caso con gobierno. Um, Nestor, I think you went mute for some reason, and our interpreter cannot hear you anymore. No, no escucha. He's back. Eh, había, había bastante... ¿Me están escuchando? I can Ahora sí. Now. Ok. Pero, Ahora pero perdimos una buena parte de lo que... Ah, bueno, voy a no repetir sé. entonces. Les decía, para sintetizar, que efectivamente tenemos un trabajo muy articulado con diferentes gobiernos internacionales y con cooperantes internacionales. Básicamente están canalizados a través de la oficina de Cancillería de nuestro país. Cancillería hace parte de la presidencia de la República y a través de ellos, digamos, hacemos la conexión. En lo político, ya en lo técnico, sí hacemos una coordinación directa entre, en este caso, el Ministerio de Ambiente y los cooperantes para desarrollar, en este caso, proyectos eh, comunitarios, proyectos eh, que lleguen al territorio. Es importante mencionarles también que recientemente se construyó, se elaboró un portafolio, es el portafolio de acción climática. El portafolio de acción climática de Colombia fue lanzado o presentado en la COP eh, pasada en, la, en Dubai eh, y, y lo, lo, lo fantástico lo, lo chévere de este, de este portafolio es que no es un portafolio de ambiente, porque nosotros entendemos perfectamente que la problemática y la solución no es un tema que esté sobre las espaldas del sector ambiente está todos los sectores que he mencionado o sea, nosotros no podemos hacer nada sin que el sector educación nos ayude, de tal forma que podamos nosotros llevar el lenguaje adecuado a los territorios. Ustedes saben también que Colombia tiene algunas condiciones complejas de seguridad en algunos territorios, entonces definitivamente también necesitamos eh, impartir orden, necesitamos de la fuerza pública, necesitamos en este caso del Ministerio de, de Defensa, del Ministerio de Cultura, del Ministerio de Salud, porque definitivamente esta problemática... Eh, y sus soluciones pues están eh, en cabeza de todos los sectores. Entonces, tenemos un portafolio que construimos conjuntamente, un portafolio que tiene una serie de medidas, el 47% de los proyectos que están citados en ese portafolio corresponden a medidas de adaptación, el 40% corresponden a medidas de mitigación, y el otro restante corresponde a otras medidas como eh, eh, en gestión de riesgo. Reducción de riesgo basado en ecosistemas también, porque es algo que nosotros estamos innovando y es que evitar un poco o reducir un poco el desarrollo de obras duras para pasar a obras un poco más híbridas o verdes. Y, eh, pues bueno, ese portafolio es sobre el, sobre el, sobre el cual estamos trabajando y sobre el cual eh, queremos desarrollarlo. Obviamente, los recursos que requieren para desarrollar todas las medidas del portafolio son insuficientes eh, desde el gobierno nacional y por eso vuelvo atrás un poco a la pregunta de la necesidad de la cooperación internacional y de los eh, diferentes gobiernos. Thank you, thank you, Nestor. That's very clear. And I think... Um... You know, it's it's really interesting to hear your experience where you're telling us about how complex this shift is. And this goes back to what Sharon was telling us earlier about, you know, in her opinion, this being the most, you know, complex system shift of our lifetime. And as you're saying, dealing with workers shifting into greener jobs, it's not just a matter of, you know, one government department. Yet we have to cooperate all together. You need the research, you need, you know, the education system, the culture um, ministry as well. So that's that's um a really nice angle that we shouldn't forget. Um 
Thanks, thanks so much. There's one extra question at the end, but let's uh, move on to Chung Yi for now. Um, Chung Yi, back to, back to you. Thanks for thanks for waiting on the line uh, for your turn. Um, tell us a bit more about Land Lease and how does the company collaborate with workforce development organizations um, and engaging public private partnerships to promote, for example, employment pathways. Uh, of course, in your sector, which is you know construction sector. Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. I think you probably everyone's hearing the complexities of um, the space, um, listening to Nestor and hearing how he has to work with lots of different key stakeholders from you know ed education to understanding folks on the ground. I don't think that that is unusual. And I think that is a big theme, right, for us to really think about all the key stakeholders. And for us, what we thought about Lend-Lease was zero in into something that we thought we would be able to make a difference, right? Because the ecosystem is so big and it's so complex. So where do you begin? And mm -hmm. that is a big question. And just to give everyone sort of a lay of the land in the US, we have about, and this will be specific to construction because this is um, the work that Lend-Lease is in. Anywhere in 2023, depending on what statistics or resource you want to use, there's about half a million to 600,000 construction jobs available. So that's something to consider. Also, yeah. there's one out of five construction workers are at average age about 55 or older, which means that we've got retirement right coming in the pipeline and this workforce will, will contract. And what this kind of looks like for us is, okay, there's an opportunity here. And then if you continue with some of the statistics about the opportunity, where do you start focusing? Well, in the construction trades overall, only 4% of women are actually engaged in the construction trades work. And that means being an electrician or a plumber or a painter or a carpenter. And these are really good paying jobs here, right? In, in the US, mm -hmm. if you're part of a, a union with benefits and, and sick days and, and, and um, those types of things are, that make a job much more sustainable. And then if you look that further um, with 4% women, 67% of the folks are Caucasian in this industry, about 22% are of Hispanic or Latino descent, 6% um, from Black and African American descent. So we've got a big opportunity to think about skilling and diversifying this workforce. So that's sort of just the, 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 the picture, right? We kind of had to think about, well, where are we going to start? So knowing that this was um, the, the problems that we want to solve, we looked at workforce in a very holistic way. In a lot of cases, we look go straight to the training. There's a lot of funding to get people trained, get them skilled, get them you know um, the skills that they need so that they can do the job. But what we forget is that before you can even get them into the training, right? Let's start with awareness. And Nestor talks about this earlier in, in his question before about the education, right? This recruitment process. We have young people, maybe in middle school or in high school, that aren't even aware that these jobs are available. So starting with awareness, building that and, and education, where do you go? Is it job fairs? Is it introducing this idea of trades as a, a sustainable living, um, working with organizations and trade schools and, you know, secondary schools to get this information out there? And then when information is out there, we have to recognize that not everyone can attend a training. So maybe the training is for 20 weeks and it's subsidized by private investment or it's subsidized by the government and folks can participate in it. But then we forget, let's say for women, there's childcare. What yeah. do we do about that? They can't attend the 20 week uh, training. That's free because there's no one maybe watching, you know, the children, or they can't afford to, let's say, commute there because there's a, a transportation, right? If they're not living in the training nearby the training location, or they don't have the tools, they can't pay for the boots, they can't pay for the equipment. Um, these are things that are, are real, right? They're supportive services that have to be accompanied with the training. So it's this, this process. And then while you're doing the training, and you've gotten your certification, that's wonderful. You've, you've um, 
now ready to go out in the world. How do you connect the person that's skilled with an actual job, right? So there's the job placement piece. And we're so fragmented in this ecosystem, right? So how does then the skilled person go and find the job? And if there are language barriers or there's a lack of internet or access to, you know, equipment to find jobs, not everyone can just go online, right? And, yeah. and search and find a job. And when you think about the just transition, we forget about some of these things that we all take for granted, quite frankly, right? Like we go on, we check our emails on our phone or our watch or our computer, or it's it's easier. But those are barriers for many people. If you're thinking about marginalized communities that may not necessarily have that access to those resources. And then let's say they get placed in a job. That's great. Then you look at some of the numbers there where let's say more than 50% of the folks that are in the construction trades that are from Black and, and African-American descent then decide they don't want to do this anymore. So all that training to get into the job, they get in there and they decide, no, this is not really what, what I want, you know? And the, the attrition is real, right? Like more than about a third of folks who end up then in a pre-apprenticeship training program, at least based in Chicago, that we're seeing, decide this is not for them. And why is that? Maybe there's not enough mentoring. Maybe it's a, a culture in, in, in the workforce that we don't understand about. And this is not just, you know, sort of isolated to construction, but any industry, right? And when you think about the culture of workforces, or if you're from a marginalized, let's say, community trying to get into a workforce that has not been predominantly, let's say, based of women or people of color, what does that feel? You know, like, is that a bit strange? You know, does it maybe feel like you're not being included, right? So the mentoring is very much important. And then advancement, right? What are those opportunities? You come in, you're part of a trade, and what is that pathway? So we can talk a lot about this, but, you know, I'll pause. But holistically, the ecosystem is complex. And I think in general, we tr we tend to just think and zero in, get folks trained, they'll get into a job. But it's in reality, not that simple. Um, we have to think about this in all different segments and parts and get all the stakeholders that are involved in these things to work together. Yes. Thank, thank you. I think that's a great way to put it, right? Also thinking about long-term investment, you need a proper roadmap and planning to decide where, where to invest. It was interesting what you were saying about, you know, you spend time training, maybe an upskilling, um, you know, a, a community to then realize that actually that wasn't exactly what they what, what some of these folks wanted. So um really interesting to 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 hear you speak. Um Let's, my next question is more about what, what is it then that works on the ground? So in your experience, what, what strategies, um, which could have been, couldn't be even policies, so programs set up by governments, um, have been effective in developing sustainable workforce program, especially that help this type of long-term engagement with, with the industry, for example, you know, your, your sector? I think one of the things we are, uh, I mean, a few things that seems to be working is first is to really think about their regional differences, right? The United States is large, Colombia is large, and what may work, let's say, in Chicago may not work in New York or may not work in San Francisco or in Nashville. Um, and this is part of that transparency that Sharon had talked about in the very, very beginning, right? having those open conversations to really understand what those needs are. Um, let's say there's a population, I'm going to say in San Francisco, and veterans, right? A big, un, you know, marginalized com community that's not really being served uh, or can be served better. What do those needs look like, right? And we think about the job, but then we have to think about the wellness of someone, right? Can they actually hold a job? right? Maybe they're physically unwell, maybe they're mentally unwell for whatever they have gone through in their lives, right? They could be formerly incarcerated. And this is very, very, you know, um, uh, 
it's prioritized in, in, in this industry because we do get a lot of workforce that's made up of veterans or folks that, you know, are formerly inca incarcerated. And what does that look like for someone coming to that workforce, right? And some of the challenges there. And this is back to the supportive services, right? Like really thinking about if we want to skill them, that's great, but maybe they're not all starting off at the same place, right? And how do we bring everyone at the level and meet them where they are. Um, so what we're seeing is the localization um, in regions is really, really important to kind of focus on, right? What those needs are and priorities of the community. And then working with the individuals to really understand where they are in their journey in workforce. Because we just assume, you know, here's a program, you know, and we'll put parameters around it. We're looking for, you know, folks that um, have an interest. And then this age 18 to, you know, let's say 50, I'm just making this all up. And then we don't go down the deeper levels to really provide them with sort of the resources they need to actually get upskilled, right? So I think those are two things that we've learned in our workforce um, upskilling programs. And this is a journey, Right. Like we were we're learning as we go as well. Um, and we're also doing measurement of um, this work, which is part of our social value target that I like to talk a little bit about. And what yeah. we're learning is that, let's say, a program to provide supportive services for every dollar invested, we're getting four dollars in return. But this pre-apprenticeship training program is for every dollar of invested, we're getting $8 in return. We're not saying one is more important than the other because we are measuring these things to understand the impact. What we're saying is we need all those things to actually then create a successful programming. So measurement is really important to help us understand this journey that we're taking. Um, we can set goals for ourselves, but if we're not measuring the progress to understand what's really changing, right? And it's easy to kind of measure outputs to say, yeah. we've skilled X number of folks. And we kind of use that as a generally a benchmark, but we're looking beyond the outputs. We're looking at impact like, okay, they got skilled. Then did they get a job? Were they able to then sustain themselves, you know, for their families? Um, and that's really important when you look about, you look at impact, right? It's not just you skilled X number of people, but then what? The so what is the question that we're trying to answer, right? Um, they're living better lives. They can afford homes. They can, you know, send their children to school. Um, they can afford food, right? Like basic things like that, life essentials. So measurement, I would say also um, is important. Um, and that's been something that we feel that's really important for a successful program. Thank you. That's such a great point. And I think it was it was brought up by by others as well. And you don't where how do you know where you're going if you really don't measure right your impact and and monitor also uh you know regularly? Um and and I like I like your point, um, to me as well. You're you're really kind of placing at the center the human, you know, the human talent and making and putting people first. So um I really like your approach. Um, maybe as we conclude our session today, I can just uh, go on to the last question. Again, again, it's the same question for you, for you both. Um, Chungi, let, let's stay, let's stay on, on you for now. Um, one final question is: what single piece of advice piece of advice would you offer to government representatives who are looking to support? again, a suitably trained workforce for the transition to more sustainable economy. You touched upon this a little bit while speaking earlier, but if you could think of one thing, one piece of advice that governments should really follow, what would that be? Um, I think really working with stakeholders to understand what impact you're trying to make with the programs, right? Like Everyone is quite aware that the U.S. is now currently our administration invested in the infrastructure bill and is large sums, significant sums of, of money um, coming to uh, each of the, the states and then to the cities and, and then towns and for infrastructure. This is one piece of it, which is fabulous, right? There's funding coming in, but then who... 
do we have a workforce ready to actually implement and deliver on these infrastructure projects, right? Like we heard earlier a little bit about the, the construction job gap. So there's a lot of opportunity there for engagement, um, not just like we think about the funding, but the funding then should match up with how we can actually deliver these projects practically and realistically. So I would say really the st stakeholders, again, back to Sharon's point much earlier, is going to be very, very important, the engagement, right? Understanding what's happening on the ground and, and the priorities of communities uh, where this funding is going to and how we're going to get folks engaged and, and involved in this process. Really good point. Um... Nestor, over to you again. One last question. Um, what single piece of advice would you yes. offer to other governments, Oops. such as Colombia? Yes? Bien. Eh, sí, con base en lo que ha mencionado Jun, con base en lo que eh, pues mencioné yo y con base en la experiencia que hemos, eh, hemos tenido, eh, nosotros consideramos que hay tres consejos que queremos dejarle a los, a, los, a los representantes gubernamentales. Uno, invertir en temas de capacitación y educación. Dos, crear nuevas oportunidades de empleo. Y tres, diseñar políticas de protección social y seguridad humana. Esos son nuestros tres, nuestros tres consejos. Creo que están eh, sustentados en lo que mencionaba anteriormente. Y quiero, digamos, terminar uniendo estos tres consejos con lo que eh, anteriormente mencioné, con algunos ejemplos de esto que nosotros estamos haciendo que une como esas dos cosas que, que, pues que, que indiqué. En Colombia hay diferentes programas. Uno de ellos es eh, PSA, que traduce eh, Pago por Servicios Ambientales. En nuestro territorio, especialmente los que conocen un poco de Colombia, eh, saben que tenemos la región Amazonía, lo han escuchado ustedes, es el pulmón del mundo pero la Amazonía está siendo deforestada. La Amazonía está siendo... El cambio de uso del suelo en la Amazonía es abrupto. Hay tala de árboles indiscriminada eh, con el fin de cultivos ilícitos. Hay tala de árboles indiscriminada por eh, la generación de ganadería, de ganadería extensiva y otras actividades pues, que, que no, no deberían ser. Eh, el gobierno nacional, en cabeza del Ministerio de Ambiente, ha diseñado este programa, Pago por Servicios Ambientales, que busca que las comunidades encuentren eh, una rentabilidad en ese territorio, una rentabilidad por conservar ese territorio. El problema es que las actividades que ellos desarrollan son mucho más rentables que lo que el gobierno en este caso puede darles a ellos por conservar. Y ahí toma fuerza lo que mencionaba yo de los tres puntos y los consejos a los, a los representantes gubernamentales. Entonces es, necesitamos sensibilizarlos, necesitamos hacerles entender a ellos en el lenguaje, en su forma, que definitivamente tenemos que hacer una paz, eh, tenemos que encontrarnos con la naturaleza, tenemos que dejar un legado para esas generaciones futuras y eso obviamente lo hacemos es con capacitación y educación. Y otros programas que tenemos, que pues no voy a entrar en el detalle, eh, como el tema de bonos de carbono, también que es conservemos esos territorios, eh, hagamos que esas emisiones que están captadas por esa, por esa vegetación que se encuentra, por esos bosques, eh, pues se mantenga y obviamente la sustitución de cultivos y listos entonces con esto creo que, que ya es pertinente cerrar eh, y, y bueno 
agradecer por la oportunidad de comentarles algunas de las acciones que estamos desarrollando en Colombia. Oh no, thank you, Nestor, for bringing your your knowledge to this to this forum. Really, um, it's been great to listen to your experience um, and providing a different perspective. You're talking just now about a sector. You know, when you think about just transition. Um, you immediately think about the energy communities or the energy uh, transition sector, but actually you're talking about a much more complex picture here. There's, you know, other sectors that are being uh, impacted, such as, um, you know, logging and deforestation or just small communities that live off their lands. And so it's great that you you bring that into the, the conversation. Um, we're... Going to towards the end of our session, maybe just to open up for any questions from the floor. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> if you want to ask questions, you can also unmute yourself and um, direct questions to us or all, all the speakers. Um, I'll just say that I can see in the chat, for example, um, Valentina from Yucatan saying that they're very interested in your scheme, Nestor, uh, in, in Colombia. So anything you can share on that, please do so in the chat or we can also share afterwards. Um, I'll, I'll leave it for a couple of seconds in case people want to come on the line and ask questions. Um, I would like to come in, Virginia. Yes, please. Yeah. Hello again. My name is Faryal, and I have a question to Chun Yi. Um, so Chun Yi, you talked about the impacts. Um, I understand that when we are talking about the impacts, we have to be really, really patient because we are not seeing the impacts right away. And majority of the time within our planning processes, we are very much um, focused on the immediate outputs. For example, you mentioned that, um, you know, how many uh, number of people we are going to train. Uh, but then talking about the impacts, we have to be patient. We have to see whether those people who have been trained have been really, uh, they have been able to secure any jobs and then within their jobs or with their job, whether they have been um, able to improve their livelihoods in the longer run. Um, so I was wondering how Lendlease is deliberately integrating uh, the impact side of things within their planning processes, uh, how it's done. And then what is the timeline that we are looking at? I'm, I'm really curious to learn about the timeline because I believe we are not looking at six months or, or, or a year's time. So how do you monitor the impact uh, with time and what sort of timeline we are looking at? Yeah, um, great question. Impact does take time um, and social value creation is, uh, you know, we don't, we always want immediate results, but you'll see that um, it's, not that way in reality. So I had mentioned earlier that Lendlease has a social value target um, to create $250 million of social value by 2025. So we're in year four of our journey. So four years ago, when we launched this target, we had the intention of uh, focusing on both environmental and social and sustainable solutions and the workforce piece of it and green economy. Um, was part of all this. So we engage in multi-year partnerships so that we have partners that we can basically measure over time, right? So a lot of times in private investment or funders go in with kind of one-time grants. And I would say that those, um, while they're helpful, challenging to kind of see um, how organizations can actually make that change or make that difference. So working with organizations that will create change over time that we knew that we would be investing more than just one year, right? Multiple years. And in terms of the measurement piece, we work with third party consultants uh, based in Australia that use the social return on investment principles, SROI. They're based on uh, Social Value International, SVI. And I can send some links here in this chat for anyone who's interested. Okay. Where we're measuring the well being, right? Environmental um, efforts, we've all kind of, you know, after more than a decade, have agreed now that carbon is the unit of measure, right? So what are we measuring when we think about measuring people, right? We figured out the planet. Now we're trying to figure out how to measure people. People communities is really about well-being. So what we're measuring when we say impact is what kind, let's say the 
job or it could be a training or it could be anything, right? Volunteering. What kind of impact from someone's well-being um, has taken place as a result of a program that we're funding? So working with these, uh, the nonprofits, we have the ability, um, they have the relationship with their job candidates and the participants that are engaged in their training. And we've been able to track them from basically coming into the program, training the program, and starting things like alumni networks, which is part of the mentoring, right? So we're learning with our organizations like, wait, we don't want them to just leave now they've got the training. How do we keep them still in our ecosystem so they can inspire others to go through the journey they've been to, right? And um, starting alumni network. So that would be like, let's say a year of three sort of like, you know, programming to think about retention. And then they share their knowledge. So we've been able to, and this is not always the case. We have folks that move and then we don't find them anymore. And that happens also. But for folks that um, we've been able to track the last four years um, with through the work of, of the nonprofits, we've been able to track um, the changes that have taken place, which is really great. Thank you, Chen Yi. If there aren't any more questions, I'd like to um, slowly <laughs> close our session today. Um, thanks again to all our speakers and to all of you really for taking the time to be with us. Um, just to reflect maybe briefly on what we've heard today, um, we, we surely we can we can say that we want to see more governments linking employment to action to address climate change and provide a significant driver for green job creation. Um, Sharon, when she opened our session today, she talked about this timeline, right, of what we've achieved since the Paris Agreement. You know, adding in the preamble the importance of just transition and you know. Progress has been quite slow. So now there is a fantastic opportunity for governments and companies um, that made a commitment to net zero emissions to reference to the implications on labor markets and skills and training needs and identify now the number and type of jobs that will be needed in the next, say, 25 or 30, 30 years, really. Um, another, another, another reflection that I wanted to make is how, well, by listening to you all speaking today, um, it's how politically charged issues around employment are, and governments around the world would lose support and that social license um, factor for the low carbon transition if quality manufacturing jobs are not created to replace of course, high carbon industries. And I guess this is especially relevant this year in 2024, where billions of citizens will vote um, for, for new leaders. Um, okay, with that, let me wrap up the session. This was our last webinar, as Faryal said earlier, of the Just Transition Task Force project, which we've run in partnership with the Scottish government. If you are interested in digging out what we've done so far in the last couple of years, um, please check out the project webpage for more knowledge products, but also case studies and articles. Um, just quickly, there will be a feedback form, a very quick one, will pop up on your screen when you leave the webinar. Please just take a minute to respond. It will be great for us to hear from you, um, your feedback on the webinar and how we can improve in the future. Um, as always, as we do with these webinars, and if you if you feel like it, please turn everybody, turn camera on for a quick family or group photos, just to say our goodbyes. Um, I've got some colleagues on the line, for example, Alpaf and others who are ready to take a screenshot. Um, and this is usually something nice that we like to do. I see people coming on screen. Thanks so much. Um, and yes, we're ready to say goodbye. Thanks so much. We'll send a follow-up email with recordings um, and some main takeaways. And thanks again and have a great rest of your day, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Goodbye. Everybody Bye. Down. And especially to our wonderful speakers. Thanks so much for taking the time Thank again. Thank you so much. Being gracias. Muchas gracias. Muy obrigado. Virginia? Yes? Yes, Nessa. Make a picture. Can you all turn on the camera before you go, please? Virginia, ¿me escuchas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Eh, simplemente para informar que eh, 
pues nos parece interesante que en algunos países y algunas personas en particular quieran y puedan conocer algunos de los avances, entonces creo que a través del correo de, de Farial podemos hacer llegar los links de los documentos, queremos que conozcan el portafolio de Acción Climática de Colombia, queremos que conozcan algunos proyectos o puede ser el, el, el programa de pagos por servicios ambientales que estábamos viendo en el chat que a alguna persona le parece importante conocerlo. O sea, la idea es que podamos aprender de las experiencias malas y buenas que hemos desarrollado. Entonces, eh, como te digo, a través de Farial vamos a, a hacer llegar, a través del correo de ella, a través de eh, vamos a, llegar los, a, a hacer llegar los links. Yes, please. That's fantastic. And you know, yeah, we absolutely, at the Climate Group, we truly believe in the power of, you know, peer learning and best practice sharing. That's how we really make sure not to make the same mistakes again, or at least making sure that what works on the ground gets spread, get disseminated, and everyone can really learn. So spot on on that, Mester. So thanks so much. And please do send over whatever you have and we'll, we'll disseminate to all the network. We really want everyone to know what's happening in Colombia. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Gracias. Gracias. Bye. Muchas gracias, Néstor y María Cristina. Gracias a todos. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. Chao. Gracias. Chao. Gracias. Have a nice day. Bye.